moments, Father, where we can spend time just listening to the revelation of your word through the Holy Spirit, Father, as he speaks directly to our heart. Lord, I ask, Father, again, that you would open the eyes and ears of our hearts, Father, and allow us to hear and understand the things that you have for us. Father, put out, help us put ourselves to the side. Help us put ourselves to the side, Father, and listen with an eagerness and ex an excitement to the things that you have for us. Father, we thank you, Lord. We love you and we praise you, Father. In your precious name we pray, amen. So in Acts 4, verse 1, um, it says this. And that's, that's the voice up there. So it's going to be, the conversation continued for a few hours there on Solomon's porch. But I want to go back just a little bit. And this is Peter speaking to a number of people, all right? If we go back to Acts 3, uh, the latter part of Acts 3, we can see that they're, they're, they're all meeting in this place. And, you know, when just it's like this. It's interesting because when you meet in a group and you think the, the conversation is done and God brings something up and it continues, well, this is where we are right now. The conversation continued for a few hours there in Solomon's Ports. Suddenly, the head of the temple police and some members of the Sadducean party interrupted Peter and John. There's always going to be somebody that doesn't want you to reveal what God is doing. And right, we see that a lot today. There's always, there's always something that the world and its system is trying to make that makes God look less important than he actually is. And so here's, here's the Sadducean party as they interrupted Peter and John. They were annoyed... They were annoyed because Peter and John were, and I love this word, enthusiastically teaching that in, in, that in Jesus, resurrection of the dead is possible. Enthusiastically. That means they were excited about this. They were absolutely beside themselves that these things could happen. And they were excited to tell people. And again, what happens? An idea of the Sadducees completely rejected. Okay. Again, we live in a time today where a lot of the things that are being revealed about Jesus, are being revealed about God, that the Holy Spirit is revealing, are being rejected today. And not just in the, I love this word that, that they use in the, in the voice Bible, not just by the outsiders, by, but many of the insiders as well. And so, so they arrested Peter and John. They arrested them. And the man who was healed and kept them in jail overnight. Well, you know, we'll just throw them in jail. We'll, we'll lock them up for a little bit. That'll discourage them. But during these few afternoon hours between the man's miraculous healing and their arrest, Peter and John, I love this, had already convinced about 5,000 more people to believe their message about Jesus. 5,000 in what? A couple of hours. Why, why was that possible? Why was that possible? Remember the word enthusiastically? Because they were enthusiastic about who Christ was. They were enthusiastic about that. So the next morning, again, the Jewish leaders, their officials, elders, and self scholars called a meeting in Jerusalem. Six presided over by Anas, the patriarch of the ruling priestly clan, along with Caiaphas and his son-in-law, John, Alexander, and other members of their clan. They made their prisoners stand in the middle of the assembly and question them. They said, who gave you the authority to create, create, create that spectacle in the temple yesterday? You know, it's kind of interesting. I, me I remember going to um, Romania. And I remember standing there, and a, a number of young people were asking me questions about, about America. <clears throat> and I hate to say this, but I told them, do not follow the ways of the American teenager. And they said, why? And I said, because American teenagers don't believe in God. And by the time I was done, there was five to 600 people in that square on the base of a statue that they had pushed off of the base because communism had been squash there. 
And all of a sudden, it was, there was an excitement. So it's kind of interesting because when we were done, the conversation didn't end. We went to a restaurant. And we started talking in a restaurant. And one person said, why did you just do what you did? And they said, because I'm excited about the eternal life and the sacrifice that was given for me so that I will never experience death. See? So Peter filled with the Spirit. Remember, this is the same Peter that denied Christ earlier on. So Peter filled with the Spirit. Again, the Holy Spirit has residence within us when we receive Christ. The Father speaks to the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit relays the message of God to our heart. So here's Peter. He is filled with the Holy Spirit. And he says, rulers and elders of the people, yesterday a good deed was done. Someone who was sick was healed. If you're asking us how this happened, I want all of you and all of the people of Israel to know this man standing in front of you obviously in good health, was healed by the authority of Jesus of Nazareth. The word of God says, by my stripes you are healed. By my stripes you are healed. Now, I don't know about you, but that's pretty exciting news for me. So he was in good health by the authority of Jesus of Nazareth. This is the same Jesus and Paul, Peter wanted him to understand, this is the same Jesus whom you crucified and whom God raised from the dead. So don't tell us that God can't raise people from the dead. See? He is the stone that you builders rejected who has become the very stone that holds together the entire foundation on which a new temple is being built. Now, I want to stop right there for I'm getting ahead of my note, but that's okay. I find it interesting when we think of the temple, we think of the temple in Israel. But do you know each one of you is a stone? That if it's attached to the stone and the anchor of Jesus Christ, the cornerstone, we are building the temple. We are pieces of the temple. We are each block built the temple. What does the temple do? The temple reveals Jesus Christ. What does the temple reveal? What is the temple also for? For the gathering of those that have made a decision for Christ. That's what the temple's for. It's a place of honor. It's a place of honoring God. And so there is no one else who can rescue us, and there is no other name under heaven given to any human by whom we may be rescued. It's only Jesus. Now the leaders were surprised and confused. They look at Peter and John and realize they were Typical peasants, uneducated, utterly ordinary fellows with extraordinary confidence. Stop right there for a moment. Are you confident? Are you living in the confidence of who Christ is? Are you living in the confidence of what Christ has done? Are you living in the confidence that you have a place prepared for you at the throne room, in the throne room of God, at the table of grace and mercy with your name on it. Are you confident? See? So they looked at Peter and John and realized they were typical peasants, uneducated, utterly ordinary fellows with extraordinary confidence. The leaders recognized them as companions of Jesus. Then they turned their attention to the third man standing beside them, recently lame, now standing tall and healthy. What could they say in response to this? He was, he was lame. All of a sudden, he's standing up. He's got good posture. His mother's going to love that. He's got good posture. He's ready to go. What can, how, do we, how do we doubt this? How do we, how do we make it go away? There was no response. Because they were lost about what to do, they excused the prisoners so the council could deliberate in private. And they said, what do we do with these fellows? Anyone who lives in Jerusalem will know an unexplainable sign has been performed through these two preachers. We can't deny their story. The best we can do is try to keep it from spreading. Oh, I love that. 
Let's shut down every church, keep the word of God from spreading. The best we can do is try to keep it from spreading. So let's, let's, warn, <laughs> let's warn them to stop speaking to anybody in this name. Let's warn them. Hmm. The leaders brought the prisoners back in and prohibited, prohibited them from, from doing any more speaking or teaching in the name of Jesus. Peter and John listened quietly and then replied, you are the judges here, so we'll leave it up to you to judge whether it is right in the sight of God to obey your commands or God's. But one thing we can tell you, we cannot possibly restrain ourselves from speaking about what we have seen and heard with our own eyes and ears. The council threatened them again, but finally let them go because public opinion strongly supported Peter and John. And this man who had received this miraculous sign, he was over 40 years old, so his situation was known to many people. And they couldn't help but glorify God for his healing. That's it. That's it. Good. All right. So this is, this, this is, this is what the Lord led me to on, on Monday. And again, the key word being enthusiasm. All right. Um, Curtis talked about the, the seven churches. And, and you know, it, it showed their lack of enthusiasm. And, and one of the things that we're seeing today is the world trying to take away the lack of enthusiasm that we should have for the Lord. I know a lot of, a lot of leaders in churches that have gone over this way. And, and the reason they've gone over this way is because they don't want to offend, and they don't want to disrupt, and they want, you know, they want to be accepted. But I love, I love what Peter and John were doing. They said, look, we're not, we're not looking for your acceptance. It's, it's better for us to listen and obey the word of God than it is to listen and obey you. And, and again, the man that was healed, how can you deny that? How can you deny that? And, and like I said earlier, when, when the revelations of the things in the Bible are shown, how can you deny the word of God? Oh, believe me, humanity will find a way. And, and to mix humanity with spirituality is absolutely wrong. It's wrong. There's, there's a spiritual aspect, and then there's a human aspect, and the human aspect is usually... Rooted and driven in pride and a sin nature. So again, here, here we have, they wanted to make, they didn't want people to know that Jesus was real. That the healing was real. That John and Peter had such enthusiasm to go out and tell everybody they could. 5,000 people in a two-hour period of time because Peter and John's enthusiasm was so high and they just ministered the truth. And these people were starving for the truth. You know, there's a population today that is starving for the truth. And I'm going to tell you something which is really interesting because I, I speak to a number of pastors, so don't tell me I'm wrong in this. There's a number of people... In the, in the spiritual realm of churches that are still starving for the truth because they're not getting it. They're not getting it. They're not free. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. And again, I said yesterday, th this, is, this is an amazing book that reveals truth. This book reveals truth. And I would advise you to be in it a whole lot. Because here's Peter. Remember when Peter was, you know, this person walked up and said, you're, you're with him. Oh, no, 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 you're not, I'm not with him. And then when Jesus said, Peter, you're going to deny me three times before the cock crows. No, Lord, I'd never do that. And, and then what happened? Peter walked away from the Lord and did what? Exactly what he wasn't supposed to do to go back to fishing. And then Jesus came and said, Peter, come on back. Come on back. And so this is the same Peter 
that did exactly the opposite of the thing God told him to do. But now he's standing there. And he is enthusiastically speaking about the Lord. So I remember the day that the Lord spoke to me and said, enough is enough. And I remember when it was, when it all clicked, that I had just been delivered from a corrupt, ridiculous, death-filled life. And, and as this clicked and it sunk in, sunk in, I remember the match flame became a roaring fire. Not because of what I believed God was calling me to do, but because I understood what God through his son had done for me. That's when I understood it. I'm not doing this because... This is my call. I'm doing this because there was somebody that loved me so much. There was somebody that loved me so much that he gave the most precious thing. Now, I lost a son. You know that. And so I have an understanding what it is for, 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 for a father to let go of his son. And I, I, I just could not figure it out until I understood the absolute love of God by the fact that he said, I'm giving this for you. You are going to be the gift of love. You're going to be the gift of grace. You're going to be the gift of mercy. You're going to be the sacrifice so they don't have to do what they did to get right with me. I'm giving you this. And when I understood that somebody who... Didn't even know, well, I figured it out later that he knew me very well. But I didn't even know him. But just by the sheer fact of he gave this for me, took that match head and blew it into an inferno. And, and those of you that are usually around me, I have no problem doing what Peter and John did. I have no problem, you know? Young man showed up for breakfast yesterday. Met him the day before. Stood in this room, speaking to him and a few other people. And I said, how come you haven't come to our church yet? You live in Standish. And he goes, oh, no, 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 no. I said, well, let me tell you something. I said, the building won't fall down. I said, so don't worry about it. And I said, you know, because, again, I don't walk into a room with the, with the big, big hat on my head with the cross on it and the 50-pound cross on a chain and, you know, carrying my Bible and looking like the pastor. I walk into somebody's living room, and I, I'm Mark. And so, because I don't want people to feel strange. So I walk in, and they are who they are. And it's kind of interesting because one of the people sit, looks at me and says, well, you know, it's pastor in your language. And I go, pfft. I said, look, my ears are falling off. Hey, you know what? I got a breakfast tomorrow, and I'd love to have you come. Where is it? At the church in a place called the Fellowship Hall. Oh. Huh. And so he showed up. He showed up with Eric and Wyatt. And I looked at him, and I said, you know, we're here tomorrow, too. And he goes, oh, no, 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 I'm good, I'm good. I said, that's all right. But you know the funny thing? My wife doesn't like some trees in our yard. And so I started talking about trees to this gentleman. And you know what? He wants some of my trees. So he gets to spend some time with me tomorrow afternoon. Where I will exuberantly, excitably, explain who Jesus is and what he did for me and that he wants to do the same thing for him. See? If we, in excitement, have an understanding of what Jesus did, then it can't be contained. Think about this for a minute. So I decided that day to never be quiet. I wanted my life to speak of the life of the one who saved me. 
Think about this. We're a living organism attached to a body of death. We become delivered and transformed no longer under the atmospheric influence of the word, world, or the flesh. Paul said you are no longer slaves to sin. In other words, you are no longer, you are no longer slaves to the atmospheric influence of the world or the flesh or the diagnosis the world gives you or any of that ridiculous garbage. If you're saying, well, oh, I don't know, Pastor Mark, then you don't believe the word of God. You don't believe the word of God. I believe the word of God. I don't have to be under the influence of this world. I belong to Jesus Christ, the risen Savior, whose blood paid for my righteousness. Why would I not want to be focused on that? Why would I want to be focused on the world, its systems, its explanations, its diagnoses, its, its ridiculousness? Why? I don't need to be focused on that. See? Atmospheric influence. Things in the atmosphere that control how we feel, how we speak, how we think, how we act. All these things are from the prince of the air. When Jesus says, I've already paid the price for that. You don't need to follow that. You need to follow me. And, and I, I love this because I keep saying I will make you, but how about this? I will create in you a desire to do the same thing that I taught the disciples to do. And that's why the word of God says, bring them into the fold, get them to understand Jesus, and then what? Baptize them, and then what? Disciple them. Jesus is commissioned to the, the, um, the disciples to go out and, 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 and disciple them. Make them fishers of men, just like I made you guys. But if we don't have the excitement, now, you know, I, let me put this in another way. I'm a bus driver. Every time I say, oh, you should drive a bus, oh, no. Oh, I could never do that. How do you know you couldn't do that? How do you know? You don't know. <laughs> no. Because Jesus could all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit could all of a sudden say, okay, look, listen up, ready? Watch this. Because I'll tell you, the last thing I wanted to do was be a bus driver. And then Jesus said to me, he said, listen, how many young kids today are being bombarded, bombarded with the garbage that the enemy wants them to be bombarded with? So I started driving a bus. I love driving a bus. I love having the conversations I have with, with the, the kids that I have. And then the Lord goes, you know what? I'm going to open another door. You're going to drive a summer camp bus. And it's kind of interesting because you know what? Again, <laughs> these are kids that are filthy rich. And, and they don't even have to care about anything. But it's kind of interesting when they're sitting behind you and you get to speak to them. And because they're talking about nuclear war. And they're talking about we're all going to die. And then one kid goes, except those crazy Christians. And I said, oh, yeah, what's going to happen to them? Because, you know, I like to play stupid every now and then. What's going to happen to them? Well, they think that Jesus is going to take them to heaven. And then I whipped around again, and I said, only if they receive him and repent of their sins. And we had a conversation, and the next thing you know, I hear... Well, I'm going to have to talk to my father about this. These are all Jewish kids. As a matter of fact, many of them were kosher. But if you ask them what that means or you ask them why or, or, or what's going on in their faith, they don't have an answer. It's just like, yep, this is what I am, whatever. No excitement, no enthusiasm. And so I got to speak about the enthusiasm that I found in receiving Christ. And that made me one of them crazy Christians. See? So again, we're a living organism attached to a body of death. We become delivered and transformed no longer under the atmospheric influence of the world or flesh. The prince of the air has no more dominion on who I am. Now, if that doesn't make you, I mean, if, the devil has no more dominion over you. That's huge. 
That's huge. Huh. I'm free. I'm set free. I'm not bound or in bondage to this world and its system. The sacrificial blood of the Lamb, Jesus Christ, has set me free. If you're free, then start living in your freedom. Start living in your freedom. It's funny because, you know, Kim tells me she's going down to the park and ride to the uh, Portland campground. And uh, she, she's down there enthusiastically sharing with all those people down there the word of God. She's not down there with her banner saying, I'm from here. I'm from. She's just excited about what the Lord has done in her life, and she's sharing it. And you know what? She's doing it secretively. But the excitement, you know, it's kind of interesting because, you know, again, I'm, I'm, I'm a little boggled in my mind right now because I just said we're free, and you guys just sat there. You're free! You're no longer bound by the crap and the ridiculousness that this world wants you to believe you are or live in. Cool. You're free. There it is. And now if you've received the Spirit of the Lord... And the Holy Spirit is indwelling within you. Your feet should be on fire. Your feet should be on fire. <laughs> this is the problem with the church today. Well, Pastor Mark, I don't want to be persecuted. I, I, don't, want, I don't want people to think badly of me. I, I don't want them to call me names. I just, I just want to be me. I just, I just want to sit. I just want to sit. I went to a church once. They said, well, you enter into faith rest. You have to do nothing. And I'm going, faith without works is dead. So when Jesus commissioned you're all disciples, by the way, if you didn't understand that. When Jesus commissioned his disciples, he wasn't just talking to the 70. He was talking to you. He was talking to you. See? Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Freedom to stand. Freedom to speak. Freedom to be excited about who Jesus Christ is. There's an excitement. And the world no longer has control over you. I, I remember when the world had control over me and I thought I had to do everything to satisfy the world to make myself likable and wanted and all this ridiculousness. And the Lord looked at me and he said, what has that gotten you? I said, into a whole lot of crap. He goes, yeah. He says, because you're a slave. You're a slave. So again, the prince of the air has no more dominion on who I am. I understand the fact that I am now, I am now distinctly different from the world. I'm distinctly different from the world. I'm now a tool of expression for the creator of all things. Tool of expression. Being led not by demands placed upon me, but led by the one that lives inside of me. See? I'm not doing it because I have to. I'm doing it because I choose to. Because the one that lives within me is now leading me, not driving me like the systems of the world. No longer walking by the sight of the physical eyes, but being led by the spiritual eyes that walk by faith. As I was reading the pass in passage 11, in the 11th verse, it stood out more than for one reason. And if I go back to that, and if I go back to 411, 
Where am I? Right there. He is the stone that you builders rejected, who has become the very stone that holds together the entire foundation on which a new temple is being built. Let me ask you this question today. Do you have extraordinary confidence, extraordinary confidence in who Christ is and what he's done and that as he being the cornerstone that was rejected by everybody else? You know, we have this problem. When something's rejected, we don't put our trust in it. Well, that's, you know, that's not going to be safe. That's, you know. It's like this, I remember once this potter, he's making a beautiful vase, and it cracked when he baked it. And he pulled it out, and he said, well, that's junk. And I said, no, it's not. It's only cracked on the top. I said, it'll still hold water because the crack is only a quarter of the way down, not a quarter of the way up. And I said, that vessel will hold some beautiful flowers. That vessel will hold beauty. We're all a little cracked. Are we willing to be used by the person that's going to put the beauty in the vessel? Or are we going to use this? Well, Pastor Mark, I'm this. Knowing that the word of God has already told you, you're no longer bound by the system. You're no longer bound by the world. You're no longer bound by the prince of the air. You've been set free. See, we believe the world more than we believe the Spirit. And so we always say, well, you know. No, I don't, I don't know. I'm sorry. I don't, I don't know. It's like uh, somebody came up to me once and said, well, you don't understand depression. And I said, no, I don't. I've never been depressed a day in my life. Even in the midst of the craziness, I've never been depressed. Never. Because I've, all, again, brought up in a church, but was always believing that life had more to it. And that if I let Christ be my life, then it was all going to be okay. Again, even living in the world, it was like, ah. Oh. I was quoting Bible verses to people as I was talking to them, friends of mine as I was smoking a joint or drinking a beer or doing whatever else I was doing at that point in time. See? Was I a perfect, beautiful vessel that the potter goes, oh, this is worth millions of dollars? No, I was a crack pot. Probably should have been used as a urinal at some point in time. <laughs> Instead, the creator said, yeah, but you're only cracked on the top. You can still hold the life that I have for you. If that doesn't excite you, you're dead. That needs to excite you. Because I'll tell you what, <laughs> I'm saved. No chains. I remember once I was going to get a tattoo of chain links on my arms, on my wrists, with a broken link going down the inside of my arm. And if people said, what does that mean? I am no longer a slave. I'm no longer a slave. I've been set free. And I was going to have set free in uh, Latin tattooed on my arm. I didn't do that because diabetics aren't supposed to have tattoos. <clears throat> but I really wanted to do that. Today you have extraordinary, today do you have extraordinary confidence? I, lo I love the word extraordinary in the Greek. It is tunkano, and it means to hit upon the mark. And it means to fall in line, to find oneself in the scene of the Lord that he has already prepared. You're in the scene of the Lord that he's already prepared for you. Because remember, it says he goes before us and prepares a place. I remember way, way back when my mother dragged me to, uh, what the heck was that church in New Hampshire? I can't remember. Um, yeah, I can't remember. Anyways, we were sitting there, and this lady is walking around, and 
she's, she's talking, and everybody said, oh, it's in tongues. I had to go up and ask because I knew it wasn't because, again, one of those things. But she came up next to me, and she spoke in this language. And, of course, my mother's going, oh. And because uh, she was like, oh, my God, she's being prophesied over. But the Spirit had spoken to the woman. And obviously, the crystal was there with me. And, and this woman said, he is going to be a mighty warrior for the kingdom of God. And so I went up afterwards, and I said to the person that was with her, I go, where is she from? And, and there's a reason this, was, this happened. She goes, she's from Romania. And I said, really? She goes, and she, she spoke in Romanian over you because the Lord had led her to reveal that God had a plan for you. Fifteen years later, I'm in a Romanian church, honest to God, and I'm speaking in Romanian to a church service that I've never spoke Romanian before. I'm going to tell you something. In the excitement of understanding who God is, he will move through the spirit in an amazing way that will create an inferno in you. An inferno in you. I want you to understand that. An inferno. And that inferno will reveal who he is to you. And in the excitability 5,000 people heard in two hours about everything that Peter and John wanted them to hear. 5,000. Oh, well, Pastor Mark, that was back then in the New Testament. That doesn't happen today. Yes, it does. Yes, it does. Yes, it does. It's happening in many places. And what I find interesting... And, and I'm sorry if this offends you. The exuberance and the excitement in these countries makes us look sick. I, I know they have no food because I'm getting calls from pastors in Africa every day, texts every day, messages every day from African pastors saying, we don't have any food. We don't. They, they do. They're being fed in the depths of their hearts and their souls. And they know God is real. I was talking to one the other day, and he goes, we have no, we have no nothing. It's been a week. And so I prayed with him. And two days later, a pallet of grain shows up. Now, I got excited for him because they got to eat. See, and it's not just there, it's other countries as well. It's other countries as well. See? So we're gonna, I, I, I love the word. Where'd I go? <laughs> Oop. I love the word extraordinary. Tunkano, it means to hit upon the mark, fall in line. How about this? To find oneself in the scene of life the Lord has already prepared. It as well means to attain as well as obtain and to receive. Now, the word confidence, because, again, they had incredible confidence, uh, you know, a, an unbelievable exuberance, um, and they were confident in it, is pepoithesis. And it means to have trust and reliance in what you believe. Trust and rely in what you believe. And it's created not from a human persuasion, but a spirit-produced persuasion. That produces faith given by God. In Ephesians 3.12, it says this. In who, did you get that one, Donna? No? That's all right. His faithfulness to God has made it possible for us to have the courage we need and the ability to approach the Father confidently. See? In whom we have confidence. Do you have confidence in the Lord today? Remember when, Pe again, I'll go back to this. Remember when Peter freaked out and denied Christ? Well, now, the stimuli of the enemy could no longer move him into a reaction based on fear. Did you hear that? I'm going to repeat it one, time, one more time. 
Peter in his exuberance no longer had, would allow the stimuli of the enemy to move him into a reaction based on fear. It now moved him in a response based on the sacrificial love of Jesus. He understood. He was no longer insecure. He no longer saw himself as a failure. Peter now trusted his character because, because he had the character of Christ. Now, I don't know if we've forgotten this, but the enemy and his demons always come against the righteous. They do. It's just If, if you're having an impact on the world, you're, they're coming for you. And they're going to try to distract. And the reason they do that is because they don't want our spirit to portray the Holy Spirit that casts out all fear. And they do this by the physical eye gate and the physical ear. So it gets into the head. See? And using those two things, we are distracted from the things that are found in the spiritual eyes and ears of the heart. We get distracted. And it's very easy for us to get distracted if we don't have confidence in who he is. See? So again, our eyes, our spiritual eyes are so important. As, as Kim, Kim just had her eye surgery, and she's like, I can see. See? You know, and I know, I know other people have issues with their eyes, and everything's a little hazy and foggy. That's through these. But when we look through these, the clarity of Christ and the clarity of who he is and the clarity of our purpose is made real. And in that realness, I, I know for me it makes me excited. It makes me excited. I'll sit in my office, I'll be doing my studying and I'm typing stuff out and all of a sudden I'll go, woo! And Crystal will go, What's going on? I said, oh, God just showed me something, and I'm, I'm smoking now. Wow. That's so amazing. See? I, I can't watch the passion without bawling like a little baby, especially when he's up there taking what should have been for me. I remember we went to Sight and Sounds and we watched that whole thing and I'm sitting there, you know, and, you know, I'm a man, I'm trying to hide the tears, my face is getting soaked, my shirt is wet, and I'm going, wow, here's the reality of what happened for me. Huh. Our eyes are so important as to what we receive. We can receive darkness or we can receive the light of God. In the garden, all Adam and Eve could see was what they didn't have. Why do you think they made the decision they made? Because all they could see is what they didn't have. And who kind of pricked them with that? Yeah, you know who. The butthead, Satan. Are you sure God said that? What, what is he keeping from you? Well, the word of God says he keeps nothing from us. There are mysteries that he'll reveal in heaven. But everything's ours. We are heirs to the throne. See? So Adam and Eve, all they could see was what they didn't have. They stood in the light of the Father, but could only live in the darkness of deception. And that's why they ate of the tree of knowledge. They were hoping that they would receive the mind of the Father, but in their emotions, driven by deceit, brought on by sight and not faith in their creator, they made a decision not based on God's character, but on the character of a fallen creature. Had they based the decision of the perfect character of who God was, they would have been in an amazing place forever. I... I um, I know somebody that, and I love this because they said, I'm going to get counseling. I said, yeah, 
Yeah, I found a Christian counselor. It was absolutely amazing. I said, what does he do? Verses in the Bible. His response is verses in the Bible. And then we sit down and talk, and then he explains what those verses mean for me. And he goes, it's all about being set free. It's all about being unlocked. It's all about not worrying about the world system and what the world system thinks we should worry about. It's not about telling me who I am. The world system tells me whom li- who I am and then telling me how to live in that place. It's about freedom. Freedom. Again, fear keeps us from allowing the light of God to enter in. And if there is no entrenched word, which in the Hebrew is matsur, matsur, which means to allow to take siege. Have you allowed the word of God to take siege in your life? As well as in close your heart in the word of God and fortify, as in setting up a defense. If that's not happening, there's no revelation. In Matthew 6, 22... The eye is the lamp of the body. You draw light in your body through your eyes, and light shines out to the world through your eyes. So if your eye is well and shows you what is true, then your whole body will be filled with light. Filled with light. If we don't follow that, then we're left in the darkness. Not revealing light that comes from a redeemed life which exudes enthusiasm of what has been done for me. What has been done Some people will every now and then come up and say, well, Pastor Mark, I don't know what's happening. No, you know, I'm talking it, but you know, nobody's responding. Trim your wick. That was another series I did, Trimming the Wick. God allowed us to do that series, Trimming the Wick. Why? Because a bad wick doesn't reveal all of the light. So how do you trim the wick? Having confidence in Jesus Christ having confidence in the word, having confidence, having a confidence in the Holy Spirit, having a confidence in the fact that I've been paid for, that Jesus went before the judge of the world and he paid for my sins. See? He set me free. You know, again, I... I think it was Martin Luther King. Free at last, free at last. Thank God Almighty I'm free at last. I know people that I grew up with, adults now, still dragging the chain, dragging the chain. How come you're you're loving life and everything's going great? I said I got rid of the chain, got rid of the ball, got rid of the weight, got rid of the bondage. Started living in the fact that I am now not who I was, but I am now who he has called me to be. And I am excited because he died for me. And I want everyone to know who loves me more than anything else. Father, we thank you for this message, Lord Jesus. Father, we just ask, Lord, that you would just allow this to ring, ring, ring in the very depths of our heart, Father. Cast out all fear. Cast out all doubt. Cast out all of these things, Father, that only keep the little match head burning rather than the roaring flame that you have established in us. Father, help us to understand that you, (laughs) nothing in the world can affect me when I'm in you. Because I no longer live for the world. I live for you. You are in me. I am in you. And I am being led by the Holy Spirit, Father. And he is leading me to those places where I am called. Father, allow me to again cast out all doubt, fear. And all those things, Lord, that I use as a crutch. Let me be that man, Father, that was lame, and let me stand tall. 
and profess who you are in my life. Father, be with us this day, Father. Bless us in an amazing way. Again, Father, bring this message that you have given us loudly in our spiritual ears, Father. Allow us to see through our spiritual eyes you on the cross. And allow that to be an excitement, a fire builder, gas on the flame. We thank you, Father, for everything you have done. We thank you for the gift of Jesus Christ. And Father, again, clean those spiritual ears out and just allow us to hear the Holy Spirit as he speaks. We thank you, Father. We love you and we praise you. Be with us today. In your precious name we pray. Amen. You are dismissed.